Hi everyone, my name is Mahsa and I'm here to present you a research paper uh, about fully unchained order books, which is a joint work with my PhD advisor, Jeremy Clark. So quickly about myself, uh, I'm a PhD candidate at Concordia University in Montreal, uh, working with Jeremy Clark, and I'm also a part-time software engineer at the off-chain labs working on Arbitrum. So here's my website, feel free to get in touch and reach out to me. All right, so let's jump into the paper. And to start with, I want to take some time and talk about different trade execution systems uh, in a crypto world. So uh, in, in crypto in general, there are four types of exchanges that allow traders to buy and sell uh, crypto assets. The first one, uh, which is the most common one, and we, we're all almost uh, use, used it before, is what we call a centralized exchange, which is an order-driven exchange where the exchange operator acts as a trusted third party between buyers and sellers. So Binance works like that. The second category is a uh, partially on-chain order-driven exchange, where uh, there are some on-chain functionalities uh, like uh, order cancellations or loading accounts, uh, but there are some functionalities of the exchange that happen off-chain and it's not on, on a blockchain. Uh, for example, uh, execution of the trade. So Loopring works like that. And the third category is on-chain dealers like Uniswap where a, a code-driven decentralized exchange uh, trades from its own inventory with some public pricing rules. And the last one uh, is a fully on-chain order-driven exchange, uh, where every functionality happens on the blockchain and there's no off-chain functionalities. And uh, for example, like the, the example of this category would be us, uh, which I'm going to explain you. All right, so here's a table that uh, kind of explain briefly uh, each category that I just uh, introduced and uh, it kind of summarizes their advantages and disadvantages. So it's a huge table. I can't really go uh, one by one and explain uh, each advantage and disadvantage for you, but um, we have a whole section on this in, in the paper and I do encourage you to go and read. Uh, but in short, what we can grasp from the table is that the last category, which was a fully on-chain order-driven exchange, has uh, the biggest advantage of all, meaning that it has the lowest trust assumption, it provides instant settlement, and it has transparent trading rules that always execute correctly, because it's a code that is sitting on a blockchain, so there's no way that it kind of executes uh, the way that we don't want. So this is perfect. So it sounds like this exchange is the most ideal one. But then there's a question of why there's no such exchange in production and in practice right now. And I have the answer for you. The answer uh, is the bottleneck that we have for designing and uh, implementing such an exchange, which is performance. Actually, this kind of an exchange, the, the fully on-chain exchanges, uh, they were experimented with and they were researched uh, within the early days of Ethereum, but because of performance reason, they were kind of abandoned. So we know that such a design is infeasible and we know that they're so slow, they're slow. But we, as a researcher, uh, we were really curious to know how slow they are and we wanted to benchmark their performance. So in our research, this was our research question that we wanted to answer. But because there was no such exchange that we could run performance tests and experimentations, what we had to do was to actually roll up our sleeves and start designing and implementing such an exchange so that we could run experimentations on. So uh, in order to implement a fully on-chain order book, we have to decide about the data structure. So most of the order-driven exchanges, almost all of them, they use order books, which is a ledger or data structure that it stores the incoming bids and asks order. So order book is a ledger and it's like a table that gets updated. And uh, we know that blockchains are distributed ledgers, right? So they almost sound like the same. So why don't we just dump an order book on a blockchain? It sounds easy, right? But it turned out that it's not really that simple because we have some challenges here. The first one is 
most of the order books, they are based on price time priority, meaning that if there are two orders that arrive to the order book with same prices, the one that arrives earlier, it gets executed earlier too. Uh, but this is not really how it works on a blockchain because there's no way to establish time. There's no centralized time server on a blockchain. So we cannot really enforce time priority. If Alice is more well connected to the network, her order gets executed first, even though she sends it after Bob. The other problem is blockchains are slow because they're updated in batches. Whereas markets, they move very, very fast. Uh, actually, there are some markets like high frequency trading uh, where they work on, based on nanosecond levels, but this is not how it works on a blockchain. The third challenge that we have is um, the problem of censorship of transactions uh, in blockchain. We know that public blockchains like Ethereum, they are totally open to everyone. Participation is open. So every node gets to see every transactions in a network before they, they get to, put, uh, to be put inside a block. So they can actually drop competitive orders or the ones that they don't really like before the orders can like be placed inside the order book. And miners are even in a more powerful position because they are, uh, uh, they are the one who see the transaction before they, they can be put inside a block. Uh, so they kind of the ones that decide how the order book gets updated. So they can see the transaction and, and they can drop the ones that they don't like uh, before they create their blocks. And yeah, they can see the future, uh, they can see the orders and they can beat you with a better price. And like uh, in a professional term, they can front run well-priced orders. So because of these challenges that I just explained, it turned out that we cannot really put uh, an order book on a public open blockchain like Ethereum. So we had two solutions. Either we close the network and we use a private blockchain like Hyperledger or Corda instead of a public one, and we stick to the order book. In that case, uh, not every node can be a miner. Uh, so there won't be any censorship or front running of transaction. And we can also have some centralized time server that can enforce uh, time priority. The other solution that we had was to stay on a public open blockchain and still get the benefits from um, this open participation in a network, but we use an alternative data structure to the order book. So what we decided to do was to stay on a public blockchain and get the benefit from this public transparent network but we use some other data structure, which we call, uh, it is called a call market. So the way a call market works is it basically works like an auction. So uh, the auction sort of opens, somebody needs to open the auction and then the orders bids and asks, they're submitted to the market. But the difference here is that they're not really executed right away. So they, they get to sit inside the market and then uh, when the market is closed, um, the orders that uh, overlap, they get to trade it against each other. So for that, we used Ethereum blockchain because we thought Ethereum has the most, um, actually the biggest adversarial model because it's uh, public, it's open to everyone to participate. So if uh, a market like call market works on a public hostile environment like blockchain, it only works better on other blockchain like uh, private ones like Hyperledger or Corda. Um, in order to, uh, I'm, some of you might not really uh, be familiar with how call market works. Uh, I got grabbed this paper table from the paper. Uh, we have a whole section with example of how call market works, how the orders are executed against each other. Um, so please go ahead and see the paper for more details. So uh, let's go back to those challenges that I explained and see how a call market would solve those challenges that I just explained. So we said that there's no way to establish the time on a blockchain and we also blockchains are slow. This is not a problem here when we were using call markets because uh, there's no notion of time in call markets. You either get to enter the auction when it's open or you don't. So there's no time priority here. And we said blockchains are slow. Uh, and interestingly, call markets are slow too. 
because uh, we're batching transactions over a period of time, like seven minute period. So it actually goes along very well with uh, the way blockchain works. About the censorship of transaction in, um, in a blockchain, we do encourage nodes to uh, pro propagate transaction as much as they can to broadcast it to as many nodes as they can so that at least one honest node uh, puts that uh, inside uh, their block. And for miners front running, in our design, we give the spread between the orders to the miner and uh, that would kind of like incentivize miners not to front run the bell price orders because they're already getting the spread. All right, so for the call market, uh, the way it works, it kind of closed the market. And when the market is closed, all the orders, they get executed against each other in one single transaction. So uh, the most expensive step for us is when we close the market and processing all the order. So we have to be really careful about the ideal data structure that we use for storing the incoming bids and asks. So based on our research, we found that priority queues are the best data structures. Uh, so we have two priority queues in our design. Uh, we use one for bids where the highest price has the highest priority uh, inside the priority queue and one for ask where the lowest price uh, order has the highest priority inside the priority queue. All right, so we know as computer science, uh, with some computer science background that there are uh, different ways of implementing priority queues. So what we did was we implemented five different priority queues for our call market. And uh, we ran a ton of uh, performance tests and experimentations to find out which one has a better performance. And what we found was um, for our specific use case where we care so much about dequeuing from the call market, also known as closing the market and processing the orders, Link list bit mapping priority queue is the best because uh, it has the best performance when it comes to uh, closing the market and dequeuing all the orders at once from the priority queue. It has the lowest gas cost. So what we decided to do is to uh, implement our main market, call market, which is called Lisi, uh, with the link list uh, with mapping priority queue. So Lisi uh, is in Solidity, of course, and it's written in 324 lines. And uh, we decided and we designed it in a way that is kind of a standalone module that a developer can go along and um, modify it the way they want. And the way it works is basically like a call market that I explained like a, a couple of slides ago. Uh, the call market opens and ex it accepts orders and the orders would come and they, they would be placed inside a priority queue, but they, they won't get executed. So the market closes, somebody needs to close the market, and then the orders that overlap, they get executed against each other. All right, so Lisi has uh, six primary functions. Uh, which allow the traders to come along, deposit their tokens they want to uh, trade and ethers as well. And then uh, we have open market for somebody to come along and open the market. And then somebody needs to uh, call the closed market function so that the market gets closed and then orders uh, are executed against each other. We have submit bids and asks function for traders to be able to submit their orders. And when the market is closed for the settlement, we have the claim tokens and claim ether, which allow the traders to claim their assets back. All right, so now that we have the design, uh, we have to go back and revisit our main research question that I raised at the very beginning of the talk, which is how many orders can be processed in a single Ethereum transaction when we close the call market using uh, the Ethereum today. So for that, we again, we run uh, a ton of uh, performance tests and uh, I, I uh, grabbed this uh, table from the paper here where uh, you can see that uh, it, it shows, the first column shows the five different priority queues that we have. So we kind of tested the call market with each priority queue to find out the performance. So what we found here is the second column shows the highest number of orders that uh, can be processed in a single call to the call market and not exceed, uh, exceed the uh, block gas limit, which at that time was around 
11 million. So as you can see here, uh, the link list uh, has uh, the highest uh, gas, uh, the highest maximum number of trade, uh, which means that it's uh, the best one in, in, term, in terms of performance. And uh, heat with dynamic array was uh, the weakest one. So we, we knew that like we couldn't exit, exceed the block gas limit, which was around 11,000, right? But uh, as a researcher and developer, uh, I, I was just curious to know how much this gas price would be if we could just uh, do like a thousand, uh, thousand pairs of trades. So I just manually increased the block gas limit inside my uh, local development setup. And then uh, I found a gas cost for that as well. It was just kind of interesting for me to know. And the last column here is that uh, is uh, what, uh, the gas price for uh, submit orders. So we know that uh, the gas price for submitting orders in a priority queue, it really depends on how many orders are already inside the priority queue, right? So we, what we did was we averaged 200 order submissions for each priority queue here. Uh, yep. So the bottom line, uh, of our experimentation is that around 100 trades uh, would be possible on every closing on layer one Ethereum. So that, that would position Lissy, a call market, uh, fully on-chain call market for uh, low liquidity uh, markets or small kind of markets, right? Um, it's not really much 100 trades per, per transaction. But uh, what we also did was uh, we ran a variant of Lissy on uh, a layer two network, Arbitrum as well, because uh, we wanted we, we were just curious to see how many orders, like how we can improve the system, right? So I, I ran a variant of Lissy on Rink Arby, Arbitrum network on Rink B, and uh, it actually showed that it reduced the gas cost by 99.88%, which is perfect. So when running Lissy on Arbitrum, it's, it's the validator who does uh, all the jobs for enqueuing and dequeuing. So we don't really care about the gas cost in that, cost, in that terms anymore. So uh, what I did was, in this case, we ran Lissy with HP dynamic array, which kind of balances the expenses between the two uh, operations, like enqueue and dequeue. So if you recall from the table in uh, the previous slides, uh, this priority queue uh, would only do around 38 pairs of orders with 5 million gas, layer gas, which is equivalent to only 6,000 layer one gas on Arbitrum. So this is a huge improvement. And also um, the layer two ARP gas uh, is kind of free for us, right? So it was a great improvement that we could show. So, uh, so yeah, with layer two scaling solution like Arbitrum, uh, we can actually do infinite number of trades per closing. And we show, uh, we just showed uh, an improvement with Arbitrum rollup that it kind of reduced the gas cost by 99.88%. And uh, yeah, so Arbitrum was a, a paper that just, that came out in 2018. Uh, by some colleagues in Princeton University, but it's now uh, turned into a huge product and everybody's using that. All right, so uh, some highlights from our research. Um, uh, what we showed was um, a call market has the fairest price execution um, among all. And we showed that around uh, uh, 152 transactions per block uh, can be processed uh, when using call market on layer one. And um, in the paper, we showed that we could mitigate front running attacks in a fully unchained uh, call market almost entirely. And uh, what, what else? Like uh, we showed an improvement of, uh, with optimistic roll-up. So we could, uh, we could almost do infinite number of trades uh, when we have our call market on, sitting on layer two, like Arbitrum. And we also, in the paper, we showed some uh, research area that needs further investigation and research, like uh, optimis uh, optimizing gas refunds or solidity not being truly object-oriented. Uh, we showed that minor extractable venue MEV uh, could be leveraged for good, for good reason. And also bridging asset for layer two needs more research and investigation. Uh, so that, that, that was uh, uh, the main uh, 
contribution of the paper, but we have a lot more inside the paper that uh, I couldn't explain because of the time. We have a whole section on front running. We did, uh, we actually did a front running evaluation between uh, our system and different kind of markets uh, with some front running example. And we showed how we mitigate uh, front running uh, when it comes to layer one uh, fully on chain exchanges. And uh, we have a whole section for different design landscapes for on-chain call markets, including how we resolve ties, how we can handle order cancellations, or who would close the market because Ethereum is function oriented. You have to go ahead and call the function so the market cannot get, cannot get closed by itself. So somebody would come and pay to close the market. So we have different uh, option for that, which we explained thoroughly. And then we have um, explanation about collateralizations as well. Yeah, um, the rest are, uh, we have sections about scheduling events, like what I explained, like closing the market and how we calculate or even not calculate market claim price and gas refunds in practice and their limitation. All right, so thank you so much for your attention. Uh, our paper is uh, on the archive and it will be, uh, appearing inside the workshop proceeding. So please feel free, go ahead and take a look and uh, reach out to me if you have any questions uh, or suggestions, they're always very welcome. And you have my website here. Uh, if you go there, you can get uh, in touch with me uh, almost everywhere, e email, Twitter, LinkedIn. Um, so uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you.